Welcome to Unfuddled Physics. Today, we're talking about buoyancy. Have you ever wondered why a helium balloon moves upward into the sky? Or why an air-filled balloon moves upward in water? The short answer is a force called buoyancy. But what is buoyancy and how does it work? And why up? Buoyancy is something that happens in fluids like air and water. To understand buoyancy, then, you have to first understand a feature of fluids called fluid pressure. And to understand this, a good place to start is with an air-filled balloon. Inside a balloon, there is an enormous number of tiny air molecules all zipping around and bouncing off each other. If they weren't trapped inside the balloon, all of these collisions would make the air molecules spread out in space until they were far away from one another. But because they are trapped, this push outward instead inflates the balloon, giving it volume. When you squeeze a fluid into a tight space, in other words, it pushes back against that squeeze in every direction. That's the fluid pressure. From now on, we'll represent it with these arrows pointing in all directions. Moreover, the tighter you squeeze a fluid, the stronger the pushback against your squeeze. That's because when you force the molecules closer together, they bounce off one another more often and with greater force. You can tell that the increased fluid pressure is pushing out in all directions by the way the balloon bulges to the sides as you squeeze it. This pushing outward also means that the pressure equalizes within the balloon. This principle is known as Pascal's Law. All of this helps make sense of a special kind of fluid pressure that you find in the atmosphere, oceans, and as we'll see, swimming pools. This is known as hydrostatic pressure, and it is the key to how buoyancy works. It might seem odd that the water in the swimming pool, like the air in a balloon, is being squeezed. After all, it's open at the top. So what's doing the squeezing? The answer is gravity, or to put it another way, the water's own weight. Let's put an imaginary line across the pool. It doesn't matter at what depth. We'll call this the squeeze line. As represented by the green arrows, the weight of the water above the squeeze line is pressing down at every point across the length of the pool. Let's simplify that to five arrows. Because the water below the squeeze line is being, well, squeezed, its fluid pressure rises to the exact point where it matches the weight pressure above the squeeze line. To repeat, the fluid pressure below equals the weight pressure above. When you think about it, that must be the case. Otherwise, that amount of weight would be able to push the squeeze line down even further. To put it another way, the fluid pressure always supports the weight of the water above it. One consequence of this is that at lower depths, where the weight of the water above is greater, the fluid pressure is higher. If we draw a squeeze line near the top of the pool, where there isn't much water weight pressing down, the fluid pressure is relatively low. As we move the squeeze line down, where there's more water weight above it, the fluid pressure increases. Finally, near the bottom of the pool, where the water weight above the squeeze line is highest, so is the fluid pressure. This increase in pressure, the deeper you go, is in fact the defining feature of hydrostatic pressure. And let's not forget about Pascal's Law, which means that the pressure below any squeeze line equalizes across the length of the pool. Knowing all this, we are finally able to tackle how buoyancy works by seeing exactly where the buoyant force comes from. Let's add something to the pool that I call a magic void. A void because it's completely empty of matter, containing no molecules of any kind, and magic because, unlike a real void, the water doesn't come rushing into it. Instead, it behaves exactly as a solid does, keeping the water out and moving as a single object. Well, you can see right away that the magic void subtracts water from above the squeeze line. This means that the weight pressure above one part of the squeeze line is less than above the other parts. Meanwhile, the fluid pressure below the magic void still matches the pressure in the rest of the pool. 
Since the fluid pressure pushing upward is larger than the weight pressure pushing downward, the net push is up. In short, the buoyant force is caused by this difference in the upward fluid pressure and downward weight pressure. Remember that this pressure difference operates on every point along the length of the void. So to get the total magnitude of the buoyant force, you need to multiply the pressure difference by the cross-sectional area of the void, shown here. And since the pressure difference is caused by the absence of water weight, this means that the buoyant force always equals the total weight of the fluid removed by a void. This is known as Archimedes' principle. So to be clear, if a void this long gives you a buoyant force of x, then a void three times the length gives you triple the buoyant force, because that same pressure difference applies to an area three times larger. In accordance with Archimedes' principle, there is also three times the missing water weight. Once the void begins moving upward, the pressure difference between the fluid pressure below and the weight pressure above remains the same. This is because as the void moves upward, the pressure below it equalizes in accordance with Pascal's law. Even though both the weight pressure and the fluid pressure decrease as you get higher in the pool, the difference between the two remains constant. When the top of the void reaches the surface of the water, there is no longer weight pressure above it, so now the net pressure pushing up equals the fluid pressure beneath it. But as long as the void is fully submerged, the buoyant force has still not changed. When the void begins to leave the water, however, the fluid pressure below it lessens, which in turn reduces the buoyant force. As you can see here, when it is halfway out of the water, it takes up less space, represented by the dotted line, and the fluid pressure below it is only half of what it was before. Here, the upward fluid pressure is one-fourth what it was when the void was fully submerged, creating one-fourth the buoyant force. Finally, when it's out of the water completely, the buoyant force is zero. Going in the other direction, if you push the void into the water, the opposing buoyant force increases the deeper you go down, until it reaches its maximum when the whole void is submerged. From then on, it stays constant, because even as the fluid pressure increases below the void, the weight of the water above the void increases at the same rate. The situation is a little different if the void is open at the top, that is, canoe-shaped. Before it's fully submerged, it behaves like the closed void. The buoyant force increases the lower down you push it. But when it's fully submerged, water rushes in at the top, effectively reducing the size of the void and adding weight that helps you push it downward. Now the notion of a magic void might seem fanciful, but when you think about it, every object in a fluid, whether a bubble of gas or a solid, takes up space that would otherwise be filled with that fluid. In other words, it creates a void in the fluid that matches its volume, moves around with it, and as we've seen, subtracts weight from the fluid. This is what makes things buoyant. Of course, if that's the case, why don't things continually float up and away? The answer, once again, is their own weight. Here is an object. The arrow represents the downward pressure of its weight. If you put it in our pool, it will sink to the point where the upward fluid pressure supports that weight. You can think of the object as coming to rest on a column of water able to support its weight. As we know, however, pressure pushes out in all directions, meaning the sideways pressure of the water also matches the weight pressure of the object. So what keeps our column of water from bursting outward and collapsing? The answer is the neighboring water, whose sideways pressure must therefore also match the object's weight pressure. This can only happen if the downward weight pressure above it also matches the weight pressure of our object. In short, an object keeps sinking until the depth of the water around it exerts the same weight pressure as it does. 
If you want to find out exactly how low an object will sink, in this case in water, you can, step one, find the volume of water that matches its weight. Step two, replace the object with a magic void that matches its volume. And step three, fill the void with the water. This shows us how low it will sit in our swimming pool. If its density is less than that of water, part of it will float above the water surface. If it starts at the bottom of the pool, it will rise because its weight does not fully replace the weight of the water subtracted by its volume until again it ends up here. If its weight in water exactly fills its volume, that is, if it's the same density as water, it neither floats nor sinks, but just kind of hangs there, suspended just below the surface. If it's denser than water, meaning its weight in water more than fills its volume, uh, which we'll represent here by a darker shade of blue, it sinks. As you can see, the upward fluid pressure is less than the weight pressure of the fully submerged object. And even as the upward pressure increases as the object sinks, this is counteracted by the weight of the water above it. Indeed, the upward pressure can never be enough to support the combined weight of the object and the water above it, meaning the object will keep sinking forever, or at least until it reaches whatever the bottom is. Note, though, that the weight pressure of the water by itself is less than the upward fluid pressure, which means that there is still a buoyant force, created by the object's volume, that opposes the downward force of its weight. Even the densest object feels gravity a tiny bit less than it would in empty space. Just to do the exercise one more time, if you want to see how much something will or will not float, take its volume and convert it into a magic void. Then find the amount of fluid that matches the object's weight and fill the void with the fluid. This shows you precisely how low it will sink, which again is to the point where the upward pressure supports its weight and the depth of the water around it is just heavy enough to create that pressure via Pascal's law. And this applies equally to the smallest bath toy in your tub and to the largest ship on the ocean.